So we're going to talk all about the episode The Door of Game of Thrones right now. A ton happened, ton of big reveals, full of spoilers. You've Hodor, seen the episode? Hodor. Hodor, Hodor. That's spoiler, spoiler. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a direct translation. <laughs> yes. All right. So we've given them more than enough time. Uh, the feelings. The feelings, Terry. I definitely teared up a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I saw that response echoed around yeah. the internet. Um, I will say, and I'll probably get some hate mail for this, I like a lot of characters on Game of Thrones. I like Hodor, but he never did the full Hodor Hodor experience to me that he did <laughs> right. some other people. I didn't really get caught he up in the He didn't really Hodor your Hodor? <laughs> he certainly didn't Hodor my Hodor, <laughs> right. but I hear that he gives good Hodor. <laughs> um, but, but that being said, like, what a just well done payoff to a character who seemed to start off a little bit like a joke, especially fans took it as a joke, sure. and then had such like a meaningful and and resonant ending. Like I thought that they did a really good job, and that's why it ultimately didn't surprise me that much when I found out that the big Hodor reveal came straight from George R. R. Martin. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I like the character, but of course by his very nature, you can't get that invested in him because he doesn't say much except mm -hmm. for the same word. But Christian Nairn did a great job giving a lot of depth to yeah, he, all the Hodor. He did, he did. Uh, and yeah, you know, it was a character that was kind of a, a likable character, but that was mostly, you know, uh, a fun thing, especially on a show that's this sort of grim and dark, that people could have fun with Hodor and joke about Hodor and make, you know, Hodor memes and gifs. Uh, but yeah, so to take that character and to give him this ending that was so emotional and sad, but also meaningful to sort of the storyline, uh, that is very cool. Like that's a very, uh, you know, great use of storytelling to do that because suddenly it puts everything in a very different perspective. When you rewatch Game of Thrones and you see Hodor for the first time, you're like, oh man, you're, A, you'll be sad, but B, it'll also be so much more meaningful why he says that one word. You why know? he says that one word and why, you know, he protects Bran and all these things. But yeah. what's interesting is a couple weeks ago when the episode Home aired, and that was another big Bran centric episode, we had this little conversation about whether the past can be changed on Game yeah. of Thrones. And I think. I certainly wasn't expecting something like this to happen on the show that seemed to hint that, yes, the pat like Bran is affecting things in the past and present, and he has this ability, though there were people debating what it looked like, whether or not Bran actually changed something. Whereas I see this as being a very, this has already happened and right. this is happening now, it's cyclical. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's the, yeah, it's the approach on time travel of, um, you can't change the past, but you always change the past, right? right. So Bran, there's, I don't think there's ever gonna be an episode where Bran saves Ned's life, right? right. Like suddenly he's changed the, the present on the show. But the idea here is that he already did it. Like that, the, the history of Game of Thrones already involves Bran tampering with the past. Mm -hmm. And that's the one version of it that's always existed, you know? Uh, and that's, but it's still fascinating because that still means that he might have changed other things, you know? Exactly. And, and that's, you know, it was funny after a couple episodes ago, like a lot of people were like, oh, did Bran go in the past and like try and change things with the Mad King? And the Mad King heard whispers and that's why he went crazy. And right. like at the time I was like, oh, that's like, that's just a silly theory. And now I'm like, no, that fully could be what it is. And there are also people theorizing that he could be Bran the Builder or, or one of these big figures in history. Because now we're at the point where, you know, we're a bit late in the story to really delve deep into the time travel element of the show. But that being said, Bran could do a lot of really meaningful things. And especially now without his mentor, because the Three-Eyed yeah. Raven died, like what does he do with all these powers, especially since it was all uploaded into him, as, as the showrunner said, right. a lot quicker than anyone planned. Yeah, uh, although that's kind of the theme of the season is everything's moving very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> things are moving very fast. Yeah, but I, yeah, what you, what you said is something I'm very curious about too, is, you know, and, and I've already seen a lot of people bring up the Mad King thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the idea that, you know, could Bran have sort of played a role in the history of Westeros uh, that no one knew, including himself uh, up till now. Already he's getting all this information and we're already talked about the Tower of Joy and what might be up at the top of the Tower of Joy. So it just seems like more and more, you know, Bran is going to be this important character. Uh, but it really is cool to have this this time element because it's uh, sort of the sci-fi thing, you know. Yeah. Again, Game of Thrones being a show that while it's First episode gave us a glimpse at uh, zombies, basically. Then was pretty much a medieval period piece until the dragons at the very end. And now we're in season six and they've gone like full fantasy and now they've got time travel and all these different things. And it's really kind of cool how they've done that. I like how they've built it along the I was way. thinking the same thing, especially in the uh, scene when Bran flashes to seeing the Night's King, the whole army of the undead, and he's walking through. And like, I was just like, 
when did we, and, and even the, the battle between the children of the forest and the army of the others, I, it was just like, we are full fantasy, and that's awesome because anyone who signed up for like Sean Bean political drama, like right. <laughs> it was in way over their head. Yeah. I do, I am gonna put a question to you and to everyone else out there. It, there's a big question mark about what comes next for Bran. Mm -hmm. Big picture, looking to the future, Bran Stark, hero or villain? Oh, I think hero. I, 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 not to say that he might not like even the Hodor thing. I mean, it's it's Game of Thrones, so there's got to be tragedy mixed in with your triumph, right? So what he did, you know, saved him in that moment, and we believe he's important and needs to be saved. But it not only did it kill Hodor in the present, but it turned out that it pretty much ruined Hodor's whole life. Like he'd mm -hmm. taken away who Hodor really was. Willis. So. So I don't think he is going to be a villain per se, but I think there might be more things like that where the idea of sacrifice, of you can't just get something good, you know, you can't just win. There has to be things you lose along the way. I think there's probably going to be more of that. See, I I don't know. I've just had this like sinking suspicion for the past few years, uh, reading a lot of theories and stuff like that, that Bran could be going more toward villain mm. than hero. And I think he's at a really interesting point right now because we know like he literally has a connection with the Knight's King. There's no three-eyed raven. Knight King, but we're Night gonna, King, we're gonna Night all King. we're gonna all oh, do that. Goodness. We've been calling Shame him Night's King for years. <laughs> and now suddenly Benny Off Wash like, no, it's no, Night, Night King. King. Yeah. Okay, Night King, apologies. Um but yeah, he has this connection. The children of the forest are maybe gone, or maybe it's just the ones who are with the three eyed raven. I'm a little unclear on that. But yeah, I'm I'm curious, you know, how deep is this connection that he now has with the Night King? Uh and what does he do now that he has all these powers? Like we learn that you know, we'll get into this in a little bit, but we learned that the Children of the Forest created the White Walkers as a weapon that clearly, I mean, the weapon's doing its job. It's killing mm -hmm. all, trying to kill all of mankind, but like, could Bran become a leader of that? They've lost a few of their generals. Could the Night King try and bring Bran into the fray, especially Protégé. with all of his powers? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I want Bran Stark to be the hero that we all deserve, but Except for this season, we rarely get the things that we want on Game of Thrones. Right. So I'm just, I'm putting the question out there. I'm curious what you guys think, Bran Stark, hero or villain? So let us know about that in the comments. And also, what do you think about the whole sort of time travel element? And, and will we be seeing more of this as far as Bran having already affected things in the past and kind of learned that he was kind of the guy in the shadows in the past history? And what other events do you think he might have affected? Uh, so let's talk about what you just brought up, uh, the reveal about the White Walkers. Again, it's kind of funny. It just kind of happened in the middle of the episode when it was suddenly like, origin story, <laughs> like throwing in. The uh, White Walker reveal to me was the biggest surprise mm -hmm. of this episode. The fact that the children of the forest created them, I think was something that people had speculated about and thought thought about, but never quite got to the version of the story that we saw here. And it was really interesting watching the inside the episode uh, with the showrunners, David Benioff and Dan Weiss, afterwards noting that since the beginning of the pilot, we've seen this repeated pattern with, you know, the, the White Walkers where, you know, they were severing limbs and body parts and putting it, and now we see that it's this children of the forest, you know, imagery and, and pattern and stuff like that. Like, the hints were there, whether or not they intended to do them then and, or snowballed it later. So I just thought it was really cool. But we were talking earlier, like, Will this actually have any impact on the show? What do you think? Yeah, I, I am wondering about that. Uh, if you read Matt Fowler's review on IGN, he raised this question too, which is it's one of those things where in the moment you're like, ooh, cool. But then it was after the fact a little, I don't know, It was it, maybe it lacked a little bit of impact in the bigger scheme of things because A, the children of the forest are a little ethereal. Like they've kind of just been there. Uh, so it wasn't like we had like a big investment in them as characters. So I do wonder if this is more just kind of giving you the info uh, and I wonder if we needed the info. You know, it's it, it's it's one of those things. Like, did we need to know what made the White Walkers, or could have they just been, you know, boogeymen out there? I, I have two thoughts on that. The first is that I think the reason a lot of people thought there was more to the White Walkers and the Children of the Forest that than meets the eye is because nothing in George R. R. Martin's world is black and white. Like, there's no way that there is a full embodiment of evil in his world. Like, it, he just doesn't write like that. And so it was always clear to me, and I think a lot of other fans that there was something else there. So I definitely think it was important to find out that not only 
family were the children of the forest who we don't know much about but assume are good guys did this terrible thing that is having these horrible repercussions but also that the white walkers and especially the night king were just people who were taken advantage of and turned into weapons and there's like this really interesting commentary on the the aftermath of war and violence and that's something that the books and also the show to a certain extent has been exploring that being said i came out of this being like wait what why how like and and had so many questions and wish that it hadn't really been dropped in sort of as you know an afterthought and was yeah. something that we did get a bit more context to though i have a feeling that that will be coming later i do wonder you know so because benny Weiss clarified for sure that the uh hodo reveal came from george r, r. martin they we, they didn't say one way or the other about the white walker reveal we're assuming that's probably another right. one that he told them oh that's their origin and i do wonder if this is a case where in the books it'll mean more uh on the show i i could see them never using the children of the force again we don't know like you said it's like were they all supposed to have been killed basically in that final battle or was that sort of just a group of them and there's plenty more out there? Right. But I can see the show not dealing with them that much more, but in the books that reveal might lead to more. You yeah, know? there's there's a lot more depth to the mythology in the books. I mean, it's just, you have a lot more pages, yeah. a lot more words. Um, this is, uh, George R. R. Martin released a chapter from The Winds of Winter that he'd read before, but he put it up online. So if you haven't read it, brief sort of spoilers for that but it, it was from the perspective of a character who's not even in the show but she's sort of like traveling through um the the wilderness north of dorne and she comes across like a ruins a ch of the children's of the forest and to me i was like "Ooh, like the children built this and stuff like that so there are these smaller moments and i feel like that's part of a broader structure that george is setting up for a big reveal like yeah. that so i agree with you that's the end of my <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's the end of my winds of winter spoiler uh, but yeah, I do think that it will mean a lot more. And I do hope that the show returns to it in some way, even if it's just, it, it feels like they're building up the Night King as a character a lot it, it, I was going to say, it could even be as we simple. We saw him, he was sort of hot. I was going to I was gonna say, it could be as simple as him turning back into his hot self at the end, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, you know just I mean, like, like. You know, I think that maybe that will be sort of the, the thing that they deal with a little bit is the sort of the tragedy of if he was once a normal guy and maybe at the end him transforming back, you know, when he's killed or something like that. Um, I do want to mention that the Children of the Forest, uh, I did like how they, it turns out they have these like thermal detonators, <laughs> you know, like little mini nukes. You know, that they I, I really like the upgrade of, on the Children of the Forest right. in season four. Like that was something that I remember when we were watching it, like, and they were like fighting Skeletor or whatever. Yeah. But like, um, yeah, it, they just looked it was a like, lot better. It was like lock and load. Like, yeah. They should have had like bandoliers <laughs> and like, you know, just <laughs> pulling out all sorts of heavy I, Someone compared it to the snitch and I was like, yeah, I can see it. Uh, I'm going to, because everything is Star Wars to me, it was, uh, uh, to me, it was a mix of the thermal detonator and those blue orbs the Gungans use in Phantom Menace. <laughs> <laughs> Except these packed yep. way bigger punch. <laughs> way better. Yeah. yeah. They, they would have uh, defeated all the battle droids. They would have completely. <laughs> this is very quickly. All right, so uh, let's move on from there. But yeah, I am curious to, to see, uh, yeah, if the children of the forest, how much they personally will come back in. But we might get hot, hot Night King. <laughs> yeah, he might I'm make, here for it. He I'm might, here for it. He might make a return. Um, Let's talk about Sansa in this episode. Uh, My queen. <laughs> she's great. I, I, uh, although it is funny, we were uh, uh, talking earlier about the fact that uh, because the ex pace of the show is accelerated so much, it just seems like uh, Westeros has like a new rail system or something. <laughs> oh People my God. are just like, zipping the, around the back and forth. I want to know, like we're talking about sci-fi coming into the show. People are teleporting left and right. They I still <laughs> feel like it seems like Littlefinger put his the army at the Vale like on his teleporter. Yeah, it no, it's like people are just like I'm gonna go here <laughs> and I'll be there the next scene. Yeah, and then they yeah. like zip back and it's 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 just funny on a show that where it used to take like a season for someone well, to track. Also compared somewhere. to the books, where like literally an entire book was just Brienne traveling around. Yeah, like like the the pains of travel were something that are, were a big part of George R. R. Martin's writing. But they were like, <laughs> we need to wrap this we, stuff. We're, up. Yeah, we're heading towards the end here folks we've got to get places so uh yeah so sansa in this episode uh she went and visited littlefinger and then zipped back to the wall yeah uh but it was a big scene with littlefinger and it was a very interesting <laughs> scene where she basically was the audience surrogate for, uh her critics surrogate. or a critic you know for a lot of people let's just say and obviously you can't speak for everyone because people have different opinions but a lot of criticisms that the show specifically got about the sansa storyline in season five she was articulating. And this is where it's interesting because because Ben Off Weiss are, you know, fairly, you know, protective and they don't do a ton of interviews and stuff. So 
who knows, but it seemed like this scene was very much answering a lot of those criticisms, and it was hard to think that they weren't aware of all that when they wrote this scene. I think that a lot of this season has been reacting to criticisms, and I think it's largely an improvement. Mm -hmm. But I do agree, like, there were two things that really stuck out to me. One, when she was like, either you were an idiot or you sent me to Ramsey knowing what he yes. was, which is a lot of what people were saying and I think is very true. And he's still like, I think she really put him, pushed him uh, out of balance on that. But then also when she repeatedly was like, what do you think he did to yeah. me? What, no, what do you think he did to me? Uh, I thought that that was really powerful. And, and it's the first time the show has ever really addressed sexual violence. It's really overlooked it in a lot of ways. It, it has. I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, that's the thing that people have brought up is that it's not that people think that, you know, obviously this is a brutal world, so it's almost darkly no surprise that this would happen. I think a lot of people's problems with it is that when it's not followed up on and the characters themselves who went through it don't seem to ever bring it up. And it doesn't seem like it even exists as it far as like the trauma that would bring. So even if this was, you know, if this scene existed partially because of a response to that, I think it was a very good scene and a necessary scene. You I know? agree. And I, you know, I hope that we still do see some ripple effects with Sansa. Like it's been something that she's talked about already yeah. this season. I hope that, you know, God, I hope she kills Ramsay Bolton. But like, I know, I know. And like, you know, it seems like we're building toward a confrontation with the Boltons. I hope that once again it does come around. But it does seem like, you know, she's gone through so many terrible things. And last season we expected more of this strong Santa that we're now getting this season. But I really do feel like she's come into her own. And, and she's still playing the politics game. Like, she lied to John about the fact that she spoke with Littlefinger and that he gave her this insight because the Blackfish is back. Yeah, well, they're talking about him at least. I mean, yeah. who knows? They could just find We're his closer <laughs> than we've ever been, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're discussing the Blackfish. It was interesting that she yeah, she, she still was, you know, uh, not revealing everything to John. She didn't talk to, to him about going to see Littlefinger. Uh, although, overall, I mean, I don't think it's supposed to be, like, nefarious at this point yet, but it is her, I think, like you said, playing the game. Uh, and he pointedly said to her, like, she's like, I'm going to be with yeah. my brother. And he goes, your half-brother. Mm -hmm. Like, reminding her, you guys aren't full blood. Like, he is a bastard. Like, all yeah. those other things that... Right, which, you know, she... And she brings up herself, too, basically, you know, saying, well, I'm if, yeah, I'm going to go along, you know, because I am a, a, a Stark. Uh, you know, we should... I just want to briefly mention, because you and I were both traveling last week, so we didn't do Dragons on the Wall. I still am absolutely thrilled just to see Sansa and John in a scene. When they got on yeah. horses together, I'm like... Ah, Joshua and Jim did an amazing job last week, the they, B team. But we also <laughs> that was they called it. themselves the yeah. B team. <laughs> <laughs> They're the A team to us. Yes. Uh, but no, it, it is still thrilling to see these characters together, only because it, on a show I where it felt squeal, like it never by the way. I like I was in New Zealand yeah. watching at like I don't even know what hour, but I was watching and I was like. Ah! Like in yeah. my hotel room, so excited. I watched it on a terrible, uh, slow hotel internet HBO Go on my on my laptop. It was all fl flickering in and out, and I still was like, "What? Yeah, like, <laughs> this is really... Teleport more! <laughs> stop! Stop freezing! This is awesome!" Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's really exciting. But it, uh, to see them together, and yes, at the same time though, you do wonder, okay, you know, how much is she sort of still looking at the big picture and what she needs to do? I absolutely think she loves John and she's happy to be back with him. So I don't think it's like she's going to betray John. Uh, but I do think it shows that she's still kind of, you know, assessing the situation. And also, like, really savvy with, with you know, looking at the different houses in the North and who they can talk to and even challenging Davos. Like, Davos, do you know the North? Do you mm -hmm. know, like, what people would do? Um, I always get a kick out of hearing that I don't think we'll ever get Frey Pies, but I am excited every time the Manderleys are mentioned. I hope we one day will meet Wyman Manderley, uh, who I think is a lot of fans' favorites. Uh, but I, I'm intrigued to see the army that they're building. Because, again, like, all the promos, it seems like we're building up to this big battle. Oh yeah, and we're definitely getting yeah. The the army building is is a big deal, and the fact that they are you know it was it was kind of thrilling again when they're having that scene talking about who would side with us, mm -hmm. and you know they're look, literally looking at the map, and you see and they have uh, for the audience's benefit they've got all the names written really yeah. big. <laughs> here's where we got to go, and here's where we got to recruit. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very exciting to see that happening. And even though it didn't happen, that little it wasn't uh, Littlefinger's army is not just going to team up with Sansa's army. You, they're still out there. Yeah. So we'll see what kind uh, of role yeah. I have a feeling that. 
Well, I mean, we're all going to need to come together to b battle the children of the forest White Walker army. Um, <laughs> yes. But there are two points I want to bring up briefly. Uh, one, a literal point, it's sort of talking about um, the the way that it seemed like the Sansa confrontation with Littlefinger was a reaction to audiences' complaints. Also, big old penis in the face, big old warty <laughs> penis right up and in there. Warty penis, yes. Um, also Appearing seemed, at Lollapalooza. Al <laughs> also seemed like it was a direct, like, you guys complaining about all the boobs that we have in this show? Well, here's a penis. Well, equal yeah. opportunity. It was, yeah, specifically <laughs> complaining that it's not equal opportunity nudity on the show. Uh, although it was still funny that it was like, has, has, Unsexual uh, a moment for uh, warty penis uh, <laughs> as possible. <laughs> and I do, I had like a couple of people tweet and text me about that scene. And I was like, listen, this this is what we've created for ourselves. For every pair of boobs, we're gonna get a big old penis <laughs> right up. Some will have yeah. warts. Um, the second thing, which is again something we didn't get a chance to talk about last week, but still brings me so much joy this week, is everything happening with Brienne and Tormund. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know that something could bring me as much joy on Game of Thrones. <laughs> As these two characters just looking at each other. And it's great. And it's especially on a show that, you know, can use some levity sometimes to just have this will they or won't they? <laughs> like, like, I love I love the idea of Tormund seeing this woman and being like, Where have you been uh, all my life? And if you watch, like go back and watch all of those scenes where it can be like John and Sansa talking to each other, but Gwendolyn Christie just like awkwardly like squirming under his gaze in all those like it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. I love it. I never want it to end. Yeah, it's 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 a gift to Game of Thrones fans, it's a gift to Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that we won't take for granted. So, so keep it coming. Yeah. Um, let us move on uh, to uh, Danny and Jorah, who only had one scene this episode, but it was a big scene. Again, accelerated rate of everything right now is kind of funny in that almost felt like we could have used another scene with them to kind of in the in the aftermath of what happened last week. It was so sort of huge. So then it was funny that the very next time we see them is Jorah's being like, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, see ya. I also thought like, I was like, Tanny, you've just wreaked like a lot of havoc. Havoc. Now you're just very composed and being like, Jorah, my Andal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I need, I need a, a transition scene in between here to come from like the craziness that yeah. was the end of it, it felt like we needed literally a scene of her like amongst the Dothraki and them walking away from them just to feel like that had just happened. You yeah, know? I did think that it was an interesting sequence. I, it didn't quite work fully mm -hmm. with me. I think of all the scenes, like we aren't really going to get into the aria of it all, but that worked more for me this week than this Danny and Jorah scene. I mm -hmm. mean, I get that Danny and Jorah's relationship is is really important to, to both these characters and to Danny's storyline. But yeah. the whole idea of her being like, you go find that cure, you find it, and you come back to me. I was like, that just doesn't feel like something that would actually happen between I, these two teams. I don't, I mean, it did, I, 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 I think I bought into that more. I, it was more the transition thing that I felt was a little awkward. I did like, you know, that, that scene between them and like him sort of articulating it all and, you know, just putting it all out there. Um, and I did wonder, you know, it being Game of Thrones again, it's like, uh, will will he a actually find a cure and b ever see her again? I mean, uh, it's it's it, there's uh, you could see all sorts of possibilities there. Uh, as far as you know, how likely is it him getting a cure? That seems yeah, very unlikely. Yeah, finding the cure to grayscale seems really low to yeah. me on the Game of Thrones priority list. The first thing I thought of, though, after that happened, is I was like, there are a couple actors on the show that you can pair them with anyone, mm -hmm. and you're promised good material. And so I was like, ooh, who are they going to pair Ian Glenn with next? Like, where is he going to go to keep furthering this story? That's what I wondered too, because it did seem like, you know, if this is the final Danny Jorah scene, I, I do think it's a good one as far as you know, has she brought up? She kept banishing him and having these harsh goodbyes with him. And so this was as good as you're going to get as far as, you know, because she's never going to be romantically with him. But he said he loved her and, you know, she says how important he is to her. And so it felt like a goodbye. Uh, but I don't think they're done with Ian Glenn and with Jorah. Right. So I am curious, you know, where he goes next. Well, speaking of where he goes next, I just had a thought about who might be heading his way that would be a good team up. We cannot go through this episode without talking about the King's Moot and I everything. I wrote the King's Moot on okay, here. I said, we, we didn't have it on our itinerary. And then I was like, the, King's Moot. The King's Moot yeah. is a very important thing that went down. Uh, and we got our full on Euron Greyjoy, who really like loves talking about c**k. Yeah. C**k specifically. Not dick, not penis, <laughs> but yes. c**k. Um, 
I like I'm He's like Ian McShane on Deadwood. <laughs> we still have Ian McShane yet to come yeah. this season. Um the King's Moot and Iron Island stuff was it, once again expedited in the show compared to the books, but I think it worked pretty well. The thing that surprised me a little bit was that Euron was like, "Yeah, I killed Balon Greyjoy. What's the big deal?" Uh, and everyone's and like, "Yeah." They're like, "Yeah, you're right. Like he wasn't really doing too much." Um, I'm I'm very interested to see where this goes next because this was a storyline that I was convinced they were not actually going to do on the show, and now we yeah. have Yara and Theon on the run with all the boats and Euron without boats, but still with all of the, the uh, Ironborn behind him wanting to go wed Danny. And with the pace of the show this season, now that he's telling everyone to start building those boats, I'm guessing they'll be done. <laughs> They're gonna be yeah. like halfway to Marine <laughs> Very next quickly. episode. I will say that was a sequence that was a little silly to me only because of how the crowd, it was almost like a wrestling crowd or something, how quickly they could turn, like how, you know, Theon really had a great sort of speech about Yara and got the crowd like, yeah. And then Euron just kind of shows up as like, guess what? I killed the king and I'm awesome. Yeah, and then they're like, yeah. Like the Ironborn aren't exactly like the sharpest tools in the <laughs> right? shed. Like, and Yara was right. They they are very serious about everything going on with them and the no one else They even cares. have a crappy as hell crown. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, a good crown. Uh, but I did, I really did. Did lo like I love the locations that mm -hmm. they find to shoot. Like what yeah. a, what a gorgeous area. And also I really loved um, everything about uh, uh, Euron. You know, being made king and the whole "what is dead may never die." Mm -hmm. And you know, I thought that that was done really beautifully, actually. And you know, everyone waiting for him to. Oh yeah, that was very very up. interesting. And and you do wonder how, how many people did this not go so well for? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because I mean, that's again, that's something that's dealt with more in the books. But you definitely get the sense that a lot of people <laughs> yeah. don't rise again harder and stronger. But yeah, as we've discussed, this is a season that's kind of giving us more sort of uh, things to cheer for than we're ever used to on Game of Thrones. And so you know. I still am really excited that Theon and Yara are truly working together and he's like truly got her back. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you know, it's like they, they took off with all those people. And I am, I mean, I'm curious where they go next. I read someone who said that they assumed that they were trying to beat Euron to, to Daenerys. Danny, yeah. uh, but, you know, there are a lot of other places that they could be useful. That is a good question because, you know, Euron did have a good point about teaming up with Danny being a good idea that Yara did not raise. Mm -hmm. So is she just going to be like screw that you screw that uncle you got a stupid idea or will she say that is a good idea I'm gonna go there. I have a feeling that we probably won't see much more of Euron this season, but maybe he does become a big player later on, or maybe they just are replacing, you know, Euron's journey with Thara, uh, Thara, Yara, and Theon, mm -hmm. uh, because as we know, uh, Danny's ships went. Oh yeah, she needs some new ships. Yeah, she needs some ships to. And she has a much bigger army now, so. Maybe. Maybe she needs all of them. What if Euron's uh, men have now built, like, modern speedboats <laughs> with motors on them? What if they're just airplanes? <laughs> right, there you <laughs> We're go. We're going full sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. Jetpacks. <laughs> you know, I like for your it. version of Game of Thrones. I'm just telling you. Once you put thermal detonators in the hands of the <laughs> children of the forest... Anything goes. Anything is possible. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, I am curious when we'll see Euron again, but I think you might be right. He might be... Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to yeah. him. Yeah, we got... 10 to 15 episodes for him to come back after this season. Exactly. Um, all right, so let us, uh, on our final topic here, let's talk about dire wolves who are having a dire season. Sorry. <laughs> it's a sorry. dire season for the dire wolves. Couldn't resist. Like, we don't have many left. Yes. It's Nymeria, who we haven't seen since He's season one. MIA. Yeah. And Ghost, which, like, if Ghost dies, I riot. Yeah, yeah. All right? Like, Melisandre can bring back dire wolves, right? Yeah. That's worth a resurrection. We would hope, yeah. We would hope. Um, I am surprised that the dire wolves are just being killed left and right. Like, or early on, the idea seemed to be... Obviously, the, the Stark children had this connection to their dire wolves, but it seemed to be that... You know, if your direwolf dies, you're in a pretty bad situation. And yeah. Rickon seems to be in a pretty bad situation. No, I've been mispronouncing it. Rickon or something. I don't know. I'm Everyone just going with Rickon, people. Oh, God, whatever. Rickon. Um, I'm just saying it. <laughs> like, Bring well, it. <laughs> of all the things. Uh, but, but yeah, like it makes me really nervous for Bran that Summer is dead. It is interesting, though, on the show, I will say that the show versus the, the books has uh, underplayed the importance of the dire wolves. And the connection that people beyond Bran have. Right, the right. So they've just kind of been there. And honestly, they sometimes aren't there. I mean, I'm trying to remember, had we seen Summer at all this season until he left to I, his death? I think 
maybe like, in like one or two shots, yeah, like just like live yeah. to the back. And again, I know that this some of this is just purely budget. a budget, yeah, consideration, and a like, do you, how much do you want to work with both effects and animals on a show that's already dealing with so much? Uh, but it was almost a little awkward to me when Summer left into battle because Summer had not really been established as being yeah. there that much, at least. Uh, so that was a little strange. And, uh, you know, and given the fact that there was so little time uh, to sort of even deal with Summer's death, it was going to be followed moments later by Hoder's way bigger death. Uh, but I do wonder if they will kind of weave back. I mean, even people in the, looking at the pilot, it was such a, it wasn't a big important moment on the show mm -hmm. them finding the dire wolves. So I, I do hope it kind of comes back, the importance of them. I agree, and I think that for all that there are a lot of things to forget in Game of Thrones, I think pretty much everyone remembers that each Stark child had a dire wolf. Yeah. Which makes me think, you know, with Shaggy Dog gone, with Summer dead, um, we only have Ghost and Nymeria left. Yeah. Is it finally time for us to see Nymeria again? Like, I, is that the silver lining in this? I think it is. I think, uh, and you know, look, uh, you know, we didn't really talk that much about Arya this week. and But, you know, overall, my feeling is, you know, we talked a few weeks ago about her and Danny and how they both kind of seemed a bit stagnant in their storylines. And then the week later, Danny, <laughs> Danny, everything changed yeah. for Danny. Arya, I'm still having that issue with. Like, I'm still like, wow, this feels so separate from everything. And her entire storyline is about getting her more disconnected. Right. Um, but if Nymeria comes back, yeah, it, it could be a way to sort of start building back like who knows if Sansa finds Nymeria or something like that I my know? favorite thing and this is a book spoiler so if you haven't read the books it's about Nymeria I don't want to spoil it for you my favorite thing is that like you never really see Nymeria again in the books as they're written so where we far. are so far yeah, yeah. but um, you hear whispers of this like massive army of wolves just like going through the countryside like killing people and mm -hmm. all this stuff you hear it from different characters and also Arya has these wolf dreams of her leaving a pack so like yeah. we know that Nymeria is out there just being like a queen dire wolf like mm -hmm. destroying things and just being a total badass and that also brings me joy and I hope that they do I hope that Nymeria isn't <laughs> I saw a really funny uh, video that was like this is what Nymeria is up to and it's like some guy riding a bicycle and someone throwing a wolf in or like a dog into the water but in the background oh. like it will be so so like a, a side note which I hope is not the case it was really funny I did a bad job of explaining <laughs> Sounds awful. There's someone throwing a dog in the water. Like, like, what kind of Nymeria's sick videos around? are you I know, watching, Terry? I know, I know. It was funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love dogs. Um, <laughs> but but I do hope that the show does something with her because we, we love the dire wolves. Please just don't kill them off because you're spending your budget elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. It was funny because it was the first time even thinking this. But once I said, though, maybe Sansa will come across her, I actually thought maybe she will. Um, or maybe Brienne. Maybe Brienne, too. But it's like Sansa, they're really, you know, they're, you know, she's kind of embracing that she's a Stark and the wolf of it all, like mm -hmm. making these new, you know, uniforms and what the uh, outfits. And, you know, she's also kind of atoning for what she used to be saying to John, oh, I used to be a nightmare. So even the fact that Nymeria, the reason she's gone was to, uh, and is, was the whole thing where they were going to kill her and they killed Lady instead uh, and how upset Sansa was. So maybe that could sort of be another full circle thing for That'd Sansa. That would be pretty great. That's, it also makes me think like, you know, we're getting everything it feels like we want this yeah. season on Game of Thrones, so I'm just going to put it out in there in the universe. Sansa Arya reunion. Oh, like, that yeah. has to be the biggest. Like, John and Danny meeting each other and Sansa and Arya seeing each other yeah. have to be, like, the two biggest things that could happen. When you think about how emotional it was for us to see John and Sansa together when they never spoke on the show, mm -hmm. imagine Arya and Sansa, yeah. you know, who had actual scenes together, yeah. an actual interaction. Yeah, that would be a huge deal. So. He'll make up for killing Hodor. <laughs> <laughs> hodor, hodor. Okay. Hodor, hodor, hodor. So, hodor, 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 hodor. <laughs> couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, if you have questions or comments for us, please tweet us uh, at Terry underscore Schwartz, Eric, uh, the Eric Goldman. I can remember my own Twitter name. <laughs> uh, please hashtag dragons on the wall. And that's it for this week, but for plenty more on Game of Thrones, keep it here at IGN.